Hello and welcome to the first of five big game preview podcasts here on the KLNS Rugby Podcast for the upcoming Guinness Men's Six Nations Championship. The tournament opens with 2022 Grand Slam champions France hosting 2023 Grand Slam victors Ireland in Marseille on this Friday night. And you can sense the palpable, palpable excitement already. Joining me tonight, we always have a fantastic panel and definitely the same this evening. Our first two guests are no strangers to this show or Irish Rugby Podcast. So please welcome back the Red Hands, Ian Frizzell and Master of None, Sam Ardell. Welcome back, lads. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Seth. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Always good to have you on for the Connacht and Ulster perspectives in particular. And this year we promise to do what no other Irish podcast has to offer with at least one guest to represent the competing nations in each and every show. So representing Le Bleu tonight is Pirate Rugby and Scarlet's Fever podcast host and Top 14 enthusiast. Mr. Hugh Griffin, welcome back, Hugh. Bonsoir, Kaylin. Ça va? Ça va très bien. I have not spoken a word of French since the leaving search, and I would like to keep it that way. Thank you very much. I've got my, so, I've got my jersey. I've got my beret. It's all here, just in case. I mean, it's better than being a Scarlet's fan, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, before we kick off proceedings, I'd like to remind our YouTube viewers that you can listen to us on the go wherever you get your podcasts, and vice versa for all your listeners if you want to have a look at the the berets and caps that are on show as always. And we will start this evening by looking at the French team, which was named earlier on today. And it reads as follows. At fullback, Thomas Ramos from Stade Toulouse. A back three consists alongside with Damien Peno and Euron Mofana of bordeaux Begle. Gail Ficou and Chantal Donti make up the centre pairing with Maxime Lusu and Mathieu Jalibert, both of Bordeaux, at half back. It's Cyril Bai, Pietro Bavaca, and Big Weenie Antonio in the front row. Paul Gabrielag and Paul Willems that make up the second row pairing. And in the back row, it's Francois Crow, the brilliant Charles Olivon of Toulon, and Captain Gregory Aldrit of La Rochelle. And on the bench, they've gone for a 6 2 split led by Julien Marchand, Red O'Wardy, Dorian Aldegheri, Romain Taufe Fenua, Cameron Woki, Paul Boudon. The exciting Nolan Lagarek and Louis Bielbiari. Hugh, I'll start with yourself. Who or what should we be looking out here for this exciting French 23? Well, I think the most exciting players are the ones coming from UBB, um, the Bordeaux side. Obviously, they've been tearing it up in Europe. I mean, it feels like we're taking to lose for granted these days, just how exciting they are. But in terms of backs, there's no two lose backs in this team, I don't believe. Um, Thomas Ross. All... Sorry? Thomas Ramos. Thomas Ramos. Okay, but he's playing at fullback and he's been playing at 10 yeah. all season. He's only had one game at fullback since the World Cup. Um, so you've got Luku and Jalibert, uh, the halfback pairing from Bordeaux, which is what everyone expected to be picked. Uh, they were the uh, the heir apparents to Dupont and Intermac, and it's kind of like something from a, a zombie film where you kill the, the Dupont, you kill the Intermac, and oh my god, now it's Luku and Jalibert. It just doesn't get any easier. Um, and then you've got the very settled centre pair partnership of Dante and Ficou. Ficou is a is a excellent player. I'm a huge fan of his. I think he's a very classic rugby player. The big conversation starter is uh, Moafana on the wing because he is mostly a center by trade. And so people weren't expecting to see him uh, there. You've got um, Biel Barre on the bench as well, who is another Bordeaux player and another Bordeaux winger. Um, obviously, Peno, you, you expected to be there. So I was asking around, why do we think Moafana has been picked on the wing? And it seems like they wanted to just get, they wanted to get him on the pitch, but they're not going to pick him at 12 ahead of Dante. So uh, it was just a case of getting him in there. He has played 11 career starts on the wing. He has played for France on the wing before. But yeah, a bit probably the surprise selection. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. If it doesn't work, they still got Bielberet on the bench to bring on. And that's not exactly a bad thing. Peno, I mean, it's not interesting to to single him out as the top player. You know, he is the top try scorer in the top 14, which isn't surprising. But what is surprising is that he's played the least minutes of any of the top 25 on that list, and he's got one more try than any of them. Like, so, And that's not including his European tries. Where, Yeah, so it's just that guy is an absolute freak. Um, obviously, Jelange missing at number six is a shame, but I think Kroos is a very able deputy. And I think um, G- Gabriel... Oh, 
you have to tell me the pronunciation here, even though I'm the French expert, the second row. Gabrielag? I'm not sure. I don't Gabriel watch Stade Francais, to be Gabriel honest. <laughs> Gabrielag, yeah, the Stade Francais guy. So he's probably one that people wouldn't be that familiar with. Um, he is uh, got about uh, a dozen and a half or so French caps. Uh, he played in the 2019 World Cup, but hasn't featured too much since. But he is currently the 10th top tackler, tackler in the top 14. And if you watch Stade Francais play, they are extremely physically brutal. So maybe that's what he's bringing to the party there. Um, but yeah, uh, doesn't get any easier with France. Their talent pool, if one goes down injured, there's another one and he's just as good, unfortunately. Yeah, that's that's the concern. It's It's a bit... It's a bit scary, to be honest. And and Sam, like we're looking at this from an Irish perspective, obviously on an Irish podcast. It's hard to look at that 23 and say, here's where we attack them. But if you're Ireland, if you're in Andy Farrell's shoes, what are you thinking about this French team and, and where can you get the, get around them, do you think? You probably have to stick to what you're good at and not try and fight fire with fire because like you said, they're, you know, their type five are going to just dominate and look to dominate. We have... You know, uh, Porter Sheehan and Furlong in the front row who maybe might be dominated at scrum time and set piece time, but they look to move that tight five around the pitch a little bit and starve them of ball potentially. I don't know. It's not a fair reflection because it's Leon and Connacht, but I thought when Connacht were successful against Leon, it was when they starved them of any ball and they started to use it a little bit and move it around and play it on their terms. It's if you let that French team have prolonged periods of possession, they will wear you down. They'll They'll impose their game plan on you. They'll make space for the likes of Fiku and Penno. They'll do that through brute force originally, like you've got Dante at 12 and him and Bundy is going to be a big battle. But where Ireland should look to do it is probably to try and outthink them, play their own game, not try and get into an arm wrestle with them because I don't think that they have what they're... I don't think they have enough there to beat them up front. I think that they can hold their own and then look to play their game. So getting onto it, maybe exploiting a bit of Mofan on the wing. I know that I read that B.A. Barry was left out potentially because of he wasn't as confident under the high ball in the World Cup as they would have liked. And that's something that Ireland do quite well. And with Lowe coming and Nash, who's very good at the high ball, it could be an area. But you've also got Ramos and Penno who are extremely confident. So it's it's not the easiest thing to break down. I don't think you're going to target a single individual and look for a weakness in a team the way you would in other games. I think that this is a, an extremely strong French team. And the way you beat them is to try and exploit them as a team and try and exploit where they are strongest, which is the fact that they're brutishly strong and, and and very mobile. If you can if you can stop them playing on their own terms and if you can keep hold of the ball enough and kick smartly, not you know, don't keep hold of the ball for the sake of keeping hold of the ball, but kick smartly, move them around the pitch, use the the probably more mobile Porter Sheehan and Furlong to compared to their front row. Uh, and then Joe McCarthy, who is an athletic freak in terms of Irish players, and Ty Byrne, who's the more mobile of the the options that could have played alongside McCarthy I think that's where you're going to look to try and exploit it but it's still a hard ask because a team as strong as that French team with the depth that they have is is they're going to be dangerous regardless you might have a little glimmer of hope with the fact that Luku is a step down from DuPont he's not a bad player but DuPont is so integral and so talismanic in the way that they have played in the last couple of years that maybe the team is just not as strong without DuPont but Luku and Jalibert have been ripping up for Bordeaux this year so it doesn't look like it's going to be a huge step down uh how that translates to an international team compared to Champions Cup team, yet to really be seen. I don't think they'll miss DuPont as much as other teams would because of how strong the rest of the team are, but they do rely on him and they are. Their, their game plan is centered around him dictating a lot of what they do in terms of his ability. So it could be, it could be a little ray of hope, but it's 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 clutching at straws there for <laughs> to, truth be told. Yeah, there there is that kind of element because you can look at I feel like DuPont is the biggest name absentee of of this. Six Nations, the fact that he's mm. gone to sevens kind of changes the angle. But then, like, Luku, as you said, has been fantastic with Bordeaux alongside Charlie Bear. If you want to talk about cohesion and partnerships, Nolan Legarek, he's been fantastic as well for Rassing and, and ripped Ulster to shreds on, the, you know, the four or five touches he actually got of clean ball in that game. And there there is still dangers there. And I suppose... Ian as well, like looking at the provinces and how they've fared, like they'd have played um Toulouse, they'd have played Bordeaux, who were heavily in there, Rassing, Leinster would have played La Rochelle, and that makes up most of the squad pretty much. Where is there anyone there that stands out from what you've seen of the provinces playing as well that people might keep an eye on? 
Well, I, I'm actually uh, a wee bit disappointed that Legaric didn't get start uh, because he was uh, he, he was the standout uh, player in the Racing team that night in Belfast. Um, I think we're maybe a wee bit fortunate that uh, they've kept Cameron Wokey on the bench uh, from the point of view of uh, um, disruption in the line-out. Uh, I'm sure there's others in, in that uh, and that uh, back row, front row, and second row, and back row. Sorry, that 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 that'll probably try attacking our, ours. But uh, Wokey did. Uh, I think we lost about four, five uh, lineouts in a row. Wokey was instrumental, uh, in in that. Um, but uh, just looking at that, uh, their back line. It's just uh, you know, even with um, Dupont away, as you said, uh, it, it's so settled. Um. You know, everybody is playing so well in their in their respective positions. Ramos might give you a wee a wee glimmer, not having played at full back this season. So you might give a wee glimmer there if you want to attack him, maybe in the air. But you know, generally that guy has been signed uh, in both those positions. So um, it's it's it it is a scary twenty three. But uh, you know, I think we have the tools. And you're going to come on to the Ireland squad now. I think we have the tools to get into them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we hope so. And probably one of the big standing points, uh, along with what Sam made, was you know, do you fight fire with fire? How do you attack this French side? And it looks like Ireland have set out to do that. I, I will just move on to the Irish team. And that starts with none other than Hugo Keenan at full back. His wingers are Calvin Nash in his first Six Nations appearance and his first Ireland start, and James Lowe. Robbie Henshaw starts at centre alongside Bundiaki. Gary Ringrow is missing with a shoulder injury. It's still unknown how long he will be out for. Jack Crowley partners Jemson Gibson Park at half back. It's an all Leinster front row of Andrew Porter, Dan Sheehan, and Ty Furlong. Joe McCarthy gets the nod at second row ahead of James Ryan alongside Ty Byrne. Peter O'Mahony captains the side from blindside and is alongside Josh van der Fleer and Caelan Doris. On the bench, then we have Ronan Kelleher. Well, this is a mistake here in my notes. Uh, we have Ronan Kelleher covering the hooker position. He's with Keen Healy and Finney Bealham. As part of the 6 2 split, they've gone with James Ryan, Ryan Baird, and Jack Conan, with Connor Murray and Kieran Frawley the only recognizable backs on the bench. So I'll go to yourself first, Ian. What catches your eye? And is it the is it the 6 2? Um, yeah, well, I mean, the 6-2 is uh, 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 something that uh, you can have a chat about. There's no question. Um, I'm not sure that um, uh, Conor Murray, Kieran Frawley are the best two to back up the, the our back line. I personally would have preferred to see um, Casey as, as our uh, replacement scrum half. You I know, agree. if we're... If we're, if we're going into the you know the last 15 20 minutes of that game I don't know we might be chasing it possibly uh but I can't see us defending uh, you know any any sort of a lead uh and uh, I think Casey would be better chasing a game than Connor Murray but okay um the other thing that 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 strikes me about it and yes okay you've got a couple of new guys coming in there in McCarthy and in, in Nash but it's a settled team um, you could say that not you know there's no sort of standout players this season so far um, other than maybe Doris um, in the forwards uh, Dan Sheehan has been playing particularly well but the rest of them are, are, are you know they're at their sort of above average sort of limit at the moment. Um, so you you have to expect that they're going to gel uh, just as well as they have done in the past. And, and and we should be able to integrate McCarthy into that without too much bother. Yeah. Um, and just... Sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, just staying on the second row, Ian, like mm -hmm. you'd have watched a lot of, of McCarthy because you watch all the provinces <laughs> regularly, as I know, but yep, a lot of Ian yep. Henderson as well. And personally, I think Ian Henderson is is unlucky to miss out on this on this 23. What would be your opinion? Look, it's very difficult to 
to uh, argue with um, the, the, the selection that the guys come up with. Um, I don't think if Henderson had been in there, I don't think you could have argued against that either. So yeah. uh, you've got basically got four second rows um, and they're interchangeable. Um, this is the first game and it's the biggest game. You know, lose this uh, and, uh, you know, heads won't go down, but you'll have a different perspective on uh, the rest of the tournament. Uh, win this and, and you know, we're chasing another uh, a Grand Slam, a back-to-back -back Grand Slam. Um, I like that, that uh, Farrell is prepared to, uh, you know, set the like of McCarthy and Calvin Nash uh, into a game like this, where perhaps in previous uh, years under different coaches, we wouldn't have done that. We would have gone for the safe, the safe uh, um, selection. So disappointed that Henderson isn't isn't there. Disappointed that there's no Ulster players in the twenty three at all. Uh, and I don't know how far you have to go back to to. to in history to see to see that, but uh, that's for another day. That's uh, that's got nothing to do with what's happening uh, um, on Friday night. Um, we'll get behind uh, these these guys here, and, and uh, hopefully that we can uh, put it up to the French in different uh, ways, maybe than what we did before. Uh, the coaches will have had three four months now to come up with a plan uh, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, you know what we're going to bring to the table as opposed to what we're going to do to stop France yeah, you know because I don't yeah. know that you can I don't know that you can go out with a with you know with a mentality that to, to try and stop them I think you've got to ask questions of them and fingers yeah. crossed we've got the squad there to do that yeah and I think we do um Sam, I, I'm not going to throw you under the bus, but you basically said that we can't fight fire with fire with France. So, like, do you just completely disregard the 6-2 split or <laughs> will, you, will you defend it? No, it's funny because I actually said on our own podcast this week that I thought Frawley was the ideal man for the 6-2 split and would be would be brought in because of it. I like Murray beside him. I, I think Casey probably has more future for Ireland, but I like Murray as a finisher, the idea of bringing that experience of Murray on coming up against Ligaric, who I believe this would be his international debut. I don't think he's played for France before. He's played under 20s. Uh, maybe he has, but... It's his, de it's his full debut, yeah. Yeah, so that I like that. I'm not actually the biggest Conor Murray fan anymore. You know, he's a fantastic uh, servant Irish rugby. I do prefer probably a Casey or even a Blade if you were pushing it uh, or a Dope coming through then. But I think Murray has a place in this team and that is to probably come on, cool head, maybe manage Frawley through it, because Frawley's relatively inexperienced, especially at this level in the 10 position. You can come on, you can change it up, he brings you that versatility. I don't think the 6-2 split is maybe to fight fire with fire. I think it's maybe to uh, to try and keep fire at bay. I like the athleticism of, like, Kelleher, Finley Bealham, as he gets around the park. Ryan Baird gives you an, another option. I think James Ryan is there. This this is just something I thought of earlier Peter O'Mahony might come off at 60 minutes. James Ryan comes on. Ty Byrne goes in the back row. You don't lose that defensive line out option. We're going to we're going to have to try and keep them at bay, but I don't think we're going to win a game trying to out forward type five pack them. And I don't think that that's what Andy Farrell will make his team do. I think that they will be well able to stand up and stand up for themselves and maybe hold strong. But if you're going to try and be brutish against them, I don't think it's the, the winning of the game. I think moving them around, using our forwards, our smart ball playing forwards. Keeping tight when needs to be tight, kicking when needs to be kicking is probably the way to go. And I think the 6-2 split actually lends itself well to that because what you're going to do is you're going to bring in and absorb a lot of contact and a lot of hits. And France are going to want to play on their dominant side. They're going to want to go through their forward pack and the likes of Dante in the middle, try and get space for Peno, wear us down. And if that's the case, you've got James Ryan to come on, who's hugely experienced. He's, I love the abrasiveness that he plays with. I think he's back to his kind of best. Cohen... Tess Lyon, Ryan Baird offers so much in two positions that there's good options there that aren't necessarily to fight, you know, go in a bare knuckle boxing match against this big type five pack. I think it's to try and play our game and to try and impose our game or allow us to impose our game on them. So I don't necessarily think the 6-2 is the same idea as when you see a South African 6-2, which is to wear you down and then to absolutely decimate you morally. I think it's actually to 
to be able to stand and fight with them and to keep ourselves in the game, that's why they've gone with it. Yeah. No, I, th- I think that's fair, to be honest. I didn't see it that way, but I I would have seen a different direction in terms of subs and kind of had the discussion. Like Everyone in Ireland knows that it's not... An Ireland squad isn't set in stone until Jerry Thornley um, writes the article the night before, and then you kind of have a fair idea which way they're going to go. And having looked at it, I was saying, you know, probably my inkling is all going to plan McCarthy, O'Mahony and Van der Fleer are the three that get replaced um, in around that kind of 50 to 65th minute mark, give or take. And then, you know, you're you're not really losing much there. And I think the, the questions, I think that's, that's what makes most sense to me. And if you do, as you said, James Ryan, bring that bit of experience, put that bit of grunt. I think Kelleher is the prime example. I know he's undisputed number two, especially with Herring injured, but like, you do want someone with a little bit of abrasiveness coming off the bench as well, and Keller will bring that. How many minutes he gets, he does. I don't know to be honest. And like the key to selection decisions, I kind of have them listed here. I think it's it's McCarthy. We've touched on that. I think Calvin Nash was probably the obvious choice to be honest. I think you know what he brings, especially against a team who will look to kick long and in behind him. He's probably the best at running it back with with options and with power out of. The, the choices now they could have went with someone like Stockdale and mixed it up but I just didn't see Stockdale and Lowe being on the same team not not because they both play in the number 11 shirt but they're two power wingers and you lose a bit of a kicking option by having one on the right hand side um, I, don't, I don't ever but, recollect seeing Stockdale on on the on the right wing so you would have been taking a massive chance um, yeah. by doing that so um Maybe if uh, if Lowe hadn't been fit, then Stockdale might have got on the left wing, but certainly not. N- never in my mind was he was he uh, uh, being considered for the right wing. Yeah, that's that's why I was thinking as well. And and like I think again, Jack Crowley is probably the obvious choice on the bench. And we did discuss it. You know, you could have qualms about Murray and Frawley. Or I can see both sides of it personally. I'd have probably gone for Casey. But I think the fact that Frawley has only one test cap means you kind of have to go for Conor Murray if he's available because there there's no better scrum half in Ireland to to lead a, a rookie around the field. He's better than Gibson Park at it. He's proven that. And I think the same almost applies for maybe someone like like having Keane Healy on the bench is it is still a fairly... It's going to be a different Ireland that comes off the bench. Maybe Healy is, is the better option, even if I think Luckman is in better form than him personally but then Keen Healy just he'd never let you down either like this these are part of the selection decisions um Hugh just for for your take on it looking from the outside is there anything that stands out to you on on that Ireland 23 James Ryan being on the bench is definitely one of them uh, I wonder if we might look at look back at it as a sliding door moment when um the referee in La Rochelle decided James I'm not going to speak to you I'm going to speak to Gary from now on whether that's that's when it changed for James Ryan. Um, of course, Welsh fans of Adam Beard uh, fighting in the streets right now. Um, but um, I'm seeing a lot of sixes. I'm seeing T- Tag Burn. I'm seeing uh, Ryan Baird. I'm seeing Peter Amani. And then obviously of Caelan Doris. I think it's an interesting point what we talk about of when those substitutions come on, where are they going to go? Because... <sighs> That there's lots of options that they could go and, uh, and play in the six. Obviously, Doris can move across there, but then who would play number eight? So, yeah, that that that's the interesting thing to me. You could see both second rows changed. I, I, I think there's a world in which that happens. Um, and I just wonder, you know, I, I, I really like the six too. And if I, if I was picking the Wales team right now, I would be advocating for a six two as well. And I wonder if this is again... Going back to last year, this is uh, the impact of the 7-1. It's not that everyone goes 7-1, but 5-3 becomes not a viable option. Because you remember that France lost to South Africa, and obviously Ireland beat South Africa, but it was very squeaky. Has that kind of taught those coaches, just gone, no, the, the way forward is to have this extra forward power? I think Casey's another good one. I'm, I get it, and I am surprised at the same time. Because Casey, I think he's got the partnership with... Crowley and in terms of um try involvements he is the top URC scrum half from that point of view 
So, but I can understand with Johnny Sexton going, and it's such a big elephant in the room for Ireland is can you do it without Johnny Sexton? And it has been for about a decade now. Um, why, why you would want to limit how disruptive you get. And so you're keeping um, Jack Van Paul, uh, sorry, Jack Van Paul Fleet, you're keeping Jameson Gibson Park there. And it's maybe fast saying, you're, you're the new guy, but you have to work in my team. I'm not going to change the team for you. Um, it's more, it's bigger picture than that for Ireland. So that that's kind of where I'm coming from. And it, it's uh, a shame that Ring Rose isn't there as well, I think. But, you know, apart from that, it's very settled. It's very settled. Yeah, and I I agree with, with a lot of your points. The, the only thing I'd say is when the different players come on, I, I do think, okay, you could go McCarthy and Ryan. It's worked okay at a decent level for Leinster. But, like, Ryan for McCarthy is, is an obvious switch, I feel like. Baird for man, he's obvious. And I think Doris can do the Van der Fleer role in this Irish attack. I'll be honest, defensively, the Irish roles I'm a little bit lost by. I, I kind of zone out in defence. I could just see a system and that's about it. But in terms of the role, I think Doris can, can fulfil the Van der Fleer role if he goes 80 and Cone and then operate in that wide channel with Baird, kind of the other wide channel. So, But it, it depends because the one thing about 6-2, as we said before, is you know, it's kind of the, you've got to plan to get punched in the face. It's happened to teams. Mm, and but, maybe it'll happen to Ireland. Maybe it won't happen today. Maybe it'll be against Italy and, and no one bats an eyelid. Yeah, just, just very quickly, the reason why I think 6-2 will become the norm now is because so many teams play a fly half at fullback. So you've yeah. got Kinghorn for Scotland. You've got Ramos for France. Um, Wales might be end up being, playing Kai Evans there who can play um, fly half as well. And Italy have been playing Tommy Allen there, although I don't think that's the long-term plan by any stretch of the imagination. Obviously, Bowden Barrett, Damien Villem, so you can go on and name these guys. So I think 6-2 is going to be pretty much the norm now. I think the big risk for most teams is actually 12, because there aren't many 12s who can play other positions. So that that's the that's the one that I would be nervous about, personally. Yeah, that's where, that's Frawley, that's where Frawley really fits for you, because he's played a lot of yeah. 12, and he started to play a bit of 15 for... Leinster this year uh, and the idea was always that he was going to be a 10 so he's he's kind of the ideal man there that's why I said on our own podcast I just on your point Hugh about the sixes I was looking at the same sort of idea but I think instead of them being all regarded as sixes I think the Farrell's gone very smart in terms of he didn't drop Ty Byrne for James Ryan because he wants you've got Byrne McCarthy to an extent Van der Fleer Doris no man are all nuisances on the ground and then Henshaw and Aki low all able to get in and around it and if you can put pressure on that rook and slow it down to stop Luku getting the ball to Jolly Bear and to stop that French backline getting onto the ball, that's I think such an important part of the game plan. And then when yeah, you know, Conan can do it on the ground, Ryan and Baird coming on as well. This this is an element of part of the game that I think Farrell will really target. And that's probably why you've gone with Byrne, even though you'd lose out a little bit of bulk. Uh, and you know, Henderson is your obvious bulk person there. But I think that it's the the making a nuisance and slowing down that ball and stopping France getting on the front foot with it is part of the plan. Uh so I don't even actually see them all as sixes, even though they all relatively are sixes. I see it more as like rolls. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like even on that of Ireland second rows, they do tend to go for maybe, you know, a, a power second row, which is usually James Ryan. He's not the biggest second row in the world rugby, but he's usually fulfilling that role. And then the line at work would be left to Bernard Henderson, depending on who starts. Now, I do personally believe that Ian Henderson is the best um, line out tactician of the Irish second rows available, to be honest. That's that's just my opinion. But I do it is that kind of role set. And like again, what if Byrne comes off, let's just say 10 minutes in, you have to take him off. Which way do you go? You could go with Bear. Like feasibly you could bring on Bear. They probably won't, but like you could because again he could just be that little bit of a menace. And like the only the only issue is probably line out calling. But like again at line out time he's He's a consistent disruptor um, on opposition ball as well. And it's important to to zone in on these points because it's important to see where the game, where we think it'll be won and lost. Um, Ian, I'll come to you first. If Ireland are to take a win or, or if France are to, to make it, I think it's three home wins in a row against Ireland. How do you think they would they would go about it either side? Uh, well, I, I think uh, any side uh, looking at Ireland over the last, um, the last while will target the, the line out and you've just talked about about the line out so uh, you know we're going to have to be squeaky clean there um, a lot of our 
um, phase play comes off good line out ball. Um, so we'll be looking to we'll be looking to uh, utilize that. So you know if our line out doesn't function, um, I think we're in a wee bit of trouble. In the scrums, it's going to be a, a you know for our own scrums. I think it's just get the ball in, get the ball out as quickly as possible, um, um, and try and limit the arm wrestling in the scrum because uh, we're not going to win that. Um, uh, but um, you know, out, 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 outside of that, uh, well, obviously we're looking for um, uh, for Crawley to to you know stamp a bit of what he brings to the game, uh, and I hope that uh, you know he's successful in in that. It's a very tough uh, ask for him in his first full uh, Six Nations game. Um, losing ring rows, perhaps you know. Uh, that's something that the French will now sit down and, and maybe target uh, that area of the pitch and behind uh, Henshaw and Lowe um, and, you know, getting them turned and, and Damien Pinot's on that side of the that side of the pitch. We know how good he is at just running at people, at chip and chase and all that sort of stuff. So those are the sort of areas that I can see where, where uh, you know, where, where Depending on who performs better at uh, either offensive or defensive, then that's where it's going to be won and lost. Yeah, uh, I, I can't disagree with any of those. And Hugh, if I, I, I think it's fair to say this is, I think it's the bookies having about four or five points. Like that's the kind of game we're talking about. So it's going to be um, narrow more than likely. How do you see it unfolding, I suppose, in terms of where the win and losing of the game would be? Be interesting to see the starts because those backs that France have got, they have very got much got the eyes light up about them. Where if they start smiling and they start going for it, it could turn into a very long day, and that they, they'll just start doing the magic. You, I think Ireland's need it to be close all the way through. Obviously, the best scenario would be that they get into a big lead, but I don't feel like that's likely. So. You want it to be close all the way through. I don't think Ireland wants to be going into the last 20 minutes chasing the game because I think the players um, that France have got on the bench, like like I reckon Wokey and, and all those ones that we've mentioned, will, if the game starts breaking up, they'll absolutely, absolutely feed off that. But you can't be too conservative either because if you get into a kicking duel with Jalibert, um, he'll play tennis with you all day. That's he loves that, and it's something he doesn't get very much credit for. He he and happily he stands on variety, his variety, doesn't like you'd yeah. have seen him a lot. Like he arguably more than Entomac in terms of his kick variation. He can I don't know how to put it. The term we usually use here is just the natural footballer in mm. terms of his kicking ability. And like France are a team who've kicked really, really smartly the last couple of years mm. and arguably have a slight improvement there with, with him, do you feel? Potentially, potentially. I remember seeing in a, one of the barrage games in the top 14 last season, he stood on his 22 and he played kick tennis with the other side. It felt like for about 10 minutes. It obviously wasn't that long, but he, he was so happy to do that all day long. And yet you see the ridiculous rugby that Bordeaux were playing as well with him. So, um, yeah, I, I think exactly as you say, I, I don't think that he's a weakness. I think what can happen, what's been happening to Bordeaux is they can get to 50 or so minutes and think the game is won and then switch off. And I think Ireland have got enough about them to make the most of that and pounce on moments of weakness. If the French have a moment of complacency or whatever it is, I think you've got what it takes to make them pay. But I think if Ireland win it, it's winning an arm wrestle and dragging them into an arm wrestle. I think if it becomes a fast game, I just I, I don't think there's not just Ireland. I'm not sure anyone can hang with France at the moment. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I'd agree as well, Sam. I'll come to you finally. Like, if if Ireland are going to get the job done, how are they going to do it? And like, do you have concerns about any part of Ireland's game that could be exploited? On the flip side of it, uh, he's been better recently, but Henshaw hasn't been himself for the last year or two. I think the last game or two, he's kind of looking back in form. But then you're also playing him at thirteen outside Aki, and 
I think uh, Gelfico could exploit that if he does get the upper hand on him. If Henshaw comes out in the same form he's been in the last week or two, uh, or last couple of weeks, he, yeah, that's fine. And that's Henshaw of old, we're grand. But if he if Fiku gets on top of that and allows that space to be made out wide and to say like Hugh did get in a fast-paced game against us and they they can dominate up front and allow their, their backs to really get a hold on it and get their hands on the ball, much like Bordeaux did against Connacht, it's just you, could, you don't actually get anything it was so it was like watching lads clutching the straws there was nothing nothing available for us there and I think that that'd be the same with Ireland I think that, that will stem from a few places the line out like Ian mentioned we'll have to be on point but I think defensively that's why you got your Peter Mahoney and your Ty Byrne there they'll, they'll need to upset the line out need to stop clean ball I think that they'll do that on the ground and if Ireland are to get anything from it I think it being in France France being favourites the the big change after Sexton I think it'll be a lot of stuff will have to go well for Ireland, mainly that I think Henshaw will have to play his, to his best uh, to the Henshaw that we know. I think Calvin Nash will have to have a massive game just because it's it's a big change from Mac there. And I think that if we can get uh, Crawley or uh, Jack Crowley to to manage the game in a way, you know, where it's played on our terms and we, we have or Ireland have the ability to kind of stop France from dominating possession and stop France from dominating up front, which will open it up for the back of them. If he kicks well and if he leads the line, if he plays in our forwards and kind of uses the athleticism of him, that's where it can be won. But I think that there's a lot needs to go right for Ireland to win this game, whereas I think France could actually probably play it to a 75%, 80% of what they're capable of and still win because of the home advantage and because I don't think the step down from... Uh, or the 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 changing of the guard from Dupont to Luku is as big as the change in the guard from Sexton to Crowley. Not talking about talent wise, I'm just talking about you know influence and longevity in the position and game plans and all of those things. Like you saw the the quarter final, Crowley didn't get on. And it's a it's a big moment for Crowley, and I I really hope it works out for him. I've got a lot of faith in him in the future. It's a massive massive kind of first taking of the ten jersey for him. So if he can manage the game. Then Ireland have a good chance, but if we let it, if we let it away from ourselves, and we let that that back line get hands on the ball after the forwards dominate, it it's going to be a long day. Yeah, I, I think the Crowley question is really interesting because, you know, I did I did a podcast during the week. And I did touch on this. What you like to see from him is can he offer variety in terms of running, passing, kicking, and types of kicking, types of passing. Absolutely, probably more so than than any other active ten in Ireland at the moment. Does he make mistakes? Absolutely. But he does tend to bounce back for them. And that's probably what's going to be needed. This is not going to be an armchair ride. It's going to be <laughs> as bullied as Munster's pack has been over the last two and a half months. This is going to be the same again. It's not going to be easy. And he is going to have to shake it off. And I think it's going to be things like playing off the cuff and, and going to the extremities. Maybe try that crossfield kick to Calvin Nash if it's on. And, you know, maybe put up a spiral bomb on Ramos, who... Thomas Ramos is a great fullback, but he has about one headless moment every two to three games. And it could well be tonight as well, or on Friday night as well. And these are the types of things. And even probably doesn't get talked about enough, but can Gibson Park help Crowley around the field? Because typically the, the fear factor with Gibson Park was when Ross Byrne came on, when Crowley came on, or when Joey Carberry came on for Ireland, he did not look as sharp as when he had Sexton beside him. He was brilliant for Sexton, he wasn't brilliant for everyone else. So can he step up? And I think he'll be empowered to be a leader now. You know, it's it's your number nine shirt. You know, Craig Casey's fighting for a spot on the bench with Conor Murray. You know, you're the number nine. Guide him around the field. And, you know, we're back to we're back where we were. And we're back flying it. And that's, it's really interesting. It, there's almost a juxtaposition because it's two guys who probably barely played 80 minutes alongside each other to two guys who are club teammates and ripping up trees in Europe. So interesting, I think, is is the word, but like that's international rugby for you. You can't just have club sites because it would be very, very boring then if we did. Ian, I'll come to you first for predictions as we wrap things up. Ireland's record in France is not great, but do you think it could get better this weekend? Um, <laughs> um Great to start with that laugh. <laughs> yeah, a fortnight ago, I I was uh, championing the uh, Ireland's chances, uh, talking about back to back Grand Slams, um, and I really forgot to look at the French side as closely maybe as I should have. Um, they've shown in the um, in in the Champions uh, Cup uh, just how potent they are across the the, the bigger teams. Um, so um, 
I hate predicting against my own team. Uh, I generally never do that, but the realistic me would see uh, France winning by 48 points. 48? 48 points. Four, two, eight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, okay. Jeez. I know you're upset about Ulster, a... Ian, but come on. <laughs> Could have got us a great headline there. Yeah. Might still, but, you know, maybe not. I... So, so that, yeah. that, that, that's where, where I'm at. I, I, I really hope I'm wrong, of course. Um, and I think that this Ireland team can win. Um, but, you know, we've highlighted the two or three areas there that um, um, I just not sure that, 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 that we're going to be able to uh, just to cope with those, uh, those changes just as much as uh, what Sam has said there, just as much as the French can. I'd agree with the margin as well. I think I do think it'll be France by a score. I I think Ireland would will hang on for a losing bonus point. And I think that could come crucial because mm-hmm. I could see France not winning the Grand Slam. I said this on uh, Tuesday's podcast. I don't know the preview podcast that we did. I don't know what day I went out. Um, and I I that's how I see it. I think France just uh, why like. If you, I haven't been to Marseille. Don't get me wrong, I haven't been to Marseille. But it's an incredibly intimidating venue. If you thought Stade de France was intimidating, this is just the same. And like, it's an eight PM kickoff or a nine PM kickoff local time. I think France will just, even if they don't hit their straps at their very best, I think they'll just have enough by virtue of all those, you know, the atmosphere being pushed on, needing to kick on, needing to give something that they didn't give at the World Cup. So I, I'd go for France as well. Hugh, you're our French expert. Um, Are you going to go and make it three from three? So there's never been a back-to-back Six Nations Grand Slam. Uh, since the Five Nations came into being, uh, obviously back in the middle of the last century, there's been two back-to-back Grand Slams. One was by England in the early 90s, and then the most recent one was by France. Um. The closest that any team has come to doing it was France. Uh, they got Grand Slams in 2002 to 2004. And they obviously got a Grand Slam in 2022. So, you know, but purely on home advantage, it France have got to be favourites. Um, and I think they've managed, to, through Bordeaux and Toulouse, they've managed to bring back the feel-good factor and they've managed to put the World Cup disappointment behind them. Uh, that's at least the vibe that I get from being outside it anyway. Um, so, yeah, I think if if Ireland were to win it and then go on and win the Grand Slam, that, that would represent, to me, a level that a Northern Hemisphere team hasn't reached in the Six Nations era. And to do it without Sexton. And Sexton isn't just a good player who you don't have anymore. He was the man for Ireland in in every way. And I don't think there'll be any shame in if you, if you, if you lose this one... Um, I don't think that means you're a bad team. I don't think, you know, as we can imagine the normal places, and I'm sure, Caitlin, you don't, I don't need to lead you to suspect which ones will have the crisis talks. Um, But I I can, I I think there is such a thing as an honourable defeat in this one. I, yeah, I'm going France probably to get a score in the last five minutes to make the scoreline look a bit one-sided, something like 27-18 or something like that. Yeah, I, I mean... That would be representative as well. Like if you say it's a late score, Ireland typically keep teams close. So like about 20 points is what France are probably going to max out at unless the defence falls apart, which I, I don't believe it has done Um, under Simon Eastery. Sam, we're, we sound pessimistic, but I do think there's there's realism and a bit of optimism in our predictions. Who do you see winning this one? And probably just additionally, do you think that the winner of this game is going to go on and a win a Grand Slam. This is a nice, put me in a sticky situation because uh, I'm going to preface this with on our own podcast on Monday, I called France for the Grand Slam. But uh, yeah. I also said that I really want and like the idea of Grand Slams becoming less common. Uh, the four out of the last six championships have been Grand Slams and it's gotten to a stage where if a team wins the, the Six Nations and doesn't get a Grand Slam, my partner and other people who are you know fair weather kind of rugby fans, Say ah, but they didn't get the Grand Slam. Like if Ireland were to lose to France now and win the Six Nations, they the kind of 
the newer rugby fans or the less less day to day rugby fans wouldn't be as impressed. So I'd like that. I'd like the Grand Slam to become more of a special occasion once every few years thing. So I'm going to say France win this, but Ireland win the Six Nations and France have some sort of French hiccup. Uh, I'm thinking it could be a masterstroke Gatland because uh, they play away in in uh, Cardiff. And I know Wales is all sorts of mental, so that might just just pip it for them. Uh, that's where I'm going with it. Uh, I'm, I'm holding out hope because I have to say France win this because on our own podcast, I said they win the, the Grand Slam. And if anyone is still listening now and they, they want to call me a hypocrite and I can't bear to be called a hypocrite. Fair enough. I, I might just get uh, really quickly Ian and Hughes prediction for the championship because it's their last podcast that goes out before the uh, ball is kicked. So Hugh, first of all, who do you have winning the championship? Firstly, I just need to correct myself. There were the five nations actually had two more Grand, grand Slams pre-war. So before anybody tweets me to tell me how much of an idiot I am, uh, back-to-back Grand Slams for England twice pre-war. Anyway, um, yeah, France. And I think the if they beat Ireland on Friday, it's the Grand Slam is in their hands and it is relying on them to mess it up themselves because none of the others should be on their level. Scotland, weirdly, should be the closest. And Scotland can beat France, but yeah. Scotland can also get smashed by France that those things both happen. So, yeah, it, that I think if they beat Ireland, then all they've got to worry about is the Scotland game and then the Grand Slam is theirs. Uh, Ian, which which way have you been leaning for the championship? I believe you touched on it earlier, but just to wrap things up. Well, uh, uh, my view on it would be whoever wins on Friday night will go on to win it, the, the, um, the Six Nations either by Grand Slam or, or by virtue of the championship. Um, uh, um, don't see um, any of the other teams really challenging um, Scotland have a decent set of backs but I still think they're very under par in their pack uh, and they get uh, you know even Ireland can boss them around so and I think that uh, Gatlin has already um, you know sort of predicted that Wales are on a uh, and a new curve and looking at further down the road uh, than this one. Uh, Italy excite me uh, because of how um, Benetton are going at the moment and even Zebra there earlier in the season. Um, and uh, Seb Neg- Negri is now my favourite player after watching the, the yeah. documentary. Um, and uh, I, I think um, the new coach coming in, they'll have a wee bit of uh, settling in to do, but I think uh, Italy might surprise us again with uh, uh, getting closer to some of the other teams than what they they might have done in the past. I I mean, I said in the preview, I think France will win this game and I think Ireland will win the six stations. I think Scotland could take France. I, I think the ideal scenario is that Wales beat Scotland on Saturday. And Scotland have I agree. something up there. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, obviously. We all agree because you, you know my opinions on the Scotland team. But, and then that fires something up in Scotland and they take France. You never know. This is the magic of the Six Nations. It's all about momentum and it's all about finding a 1% from nowhere. And... Scotland, Scotland don't play England until later on in the tournament. So normally... Round they, three, I they... think, isn't it? Okay, so if so, Scotland... If they have England up first, they beat England, and then that's their big one done. And then they kind of it's all just relax from there. Whereas if they don't get to beat England until later on, you know, the, the Scotland hype train has got to get going somehow. So they, they're going to beat somebody. It's going to be all on Finn. It's going to be in spite of chances. It's going to be all on Finn's back. And the Netflix documentaries will pay to as such if it gets recommissioned for next year. But lads, we will leave it at that for tonight. So thanks to Ian, to Hugh, and to Sam for joining me. and. Always great to get your perspectives on things. No problem, Caelan. Thank, thanks again for having us on. Thanks for having us. Yeah, good fun, mate. As always. And remember, for those who are not travelling to the game, you can catch it on Virgin Media 1 and on ITV or whoever your local broadcaster is. That's at 8pm Irish time on Friday night, 9pm local time. Elsewhere this weekend, these are some of the games to be covering on the podcast this week. On Saturday, we have Italy hosting England from 2.15 on Virgin Media 1 and ITV also. Later that day, Wales take on Scotland and Cardiff. That is at 4.45 on RT2 and BBC One. 
The Ireland under twenties opened their campaign, looking to go back to back to back against France at ten past eight on Virgin Media Two. And I believe under twenties that BBC I player, Hugh. Uh, yeah, um, often the Welsh under twenties are on S four C, and you'll be able to catch it through the BBC Sport website as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. I I meant to ask beforehand, but I didn't. And also on Saturday, which we'll also be talking about on these airwaves, um, Munster take on the Crusaders in a much anticipated flash. That's at five pm on TG Car. All these games, we'll be talking about them next week. On Sunday, we'll look at all the Six Nations games in our weekly review of the tournament. So stay tuned for that. While the Red Army Pod will be back to look back on Monster Crusaders and with a very special eye on that game coming very, very soon. I'll keep you posted on that. So, as always, thanks home to everyone for listening and to my brilliant guests for contributing. If you like what you see or hear, please do like, subscribe, leave a review. It all makes a difference. And you'll find the links for my stuff and for the lads down below. But for now, until next time, Take it easy.